Uh, thanks a lot. Well, first of all, thank you for coming along. And second, I would like to thank Billy Bragg for coming along as well, because it's not easy when you come into a, you come to a, a different political traditions meeting and you put your line on it. So I hope people treat that with the courtesy that that deserves. I'd also like to say something else about Billy. For me, uh, the first time I saw Billy Bragg was in 1984 during the miners' strike, and he's someone's music I've admired massively since. And I believe, personally, his political commitment as a musician is second to absolutely none at all. So that's, I want to say that first. But there is a big but. <laughs> and this is the but I want to get to, really, because I want to... We're not here to discuss Billy's music or his uh, political commitment. I'm, I want to discuss Billy's uh, latest book and the idea that can being a progressive patriot help us in the fight against the BNP. And it's on that front I want to argue an emphatic no. No, it can't. And I want to really start with a couple of non-controversial points, then get to the, the nub of the argument. The first thing I want to say is, who are the BNP? Well, one of my great heroes is a man called Woody Guthrie. I know it's Billy's as well. And that man played with a guitar, an acoustic guitar, and written on that guitar was, a, was the words, this machine kills fascists. And it's a great slogan. It's one of the great iconic moments in popular culture. And I want to say why I thought Woody Guthrie was right to do that and why we're right to do the same thing again. Because the first thing in the fight against the BNP, the first thing we have to do is we have to make them and label them what they are, which is fascists and Nazis. And I'll tell you why quite simply. There's two reasons. One is they hate it. And that's good enough reason to do anything against it if they hate it. <laughs> secondly, secondly, everybody understands the term fascist and Nazi but when you start using words like extremist and far right, it doesn't have the same connotation to everyone as what fascism and, that, and Nazism does because that labels them as what everyone remembers the worst, one of the worst atrocities Europe ever faced in World War II. And that's why we label them what they are and we call them what they are despite whatever they do. They threatened me a year ago to say that if we called them Nazi again at any public meeting, they were going to sue me. I said it there. You're, not, you're a bunch of Nazis. Sue me if you dare bring it on, and they've never brought it on, so I just keep doing it. So we'll keep going that, on that basis. <laughs> I also want to say another reason why they're Nazis. About a year ago, I spoke at a university in uh, the North, uh, sorry, this, um, West Midlands, and a young bloke came up to me, he's about 19 years of old, age, and he said he wanted to speak to me after the meeting, he said he was a member of the BNP. It's one of those kind of decisions you think, should I go and talk to him, or should I just as Trotsky once said, equate his head with the pavement. And I debated about it long and hard, and in the end I thought, I'll go and have a chat with him. And he came to me and he handed me the entire BNP list of the year over. He told me that he was leaving the BNP and he wanted to become an anti-fascist, which I thought was quite incredible. And I wasn't sure if I trusted him. And over the last year, we've been talking to this young, young man. RT, the Irish TV station, have been interviewing him. They're going to make a documentary about him. And he said to me two really important things. Well, one really important thing, and I think the most important thing he says in the documentary is this. He describes going to BNP meetings in Coventry and Northampton, and he says what they're like is they are meetings that play on the question of how bitter people are about housing, education, hatred of the government, even the Iraq war. And he says, and so as far as I was concerned, what they were was they, they articulated around the question of race, but primarily they dipped into people's anger about it. He then said this. It was only at the end of the meetings, when you met the leadership of the BNP, did they say, and this is the most important thing, he said, the, North, the Midlands organiser said to me, by the way, son, we might have to have a Holocaust-type solution for all those Bangladeshis, Pakistanis and Indians in this country. And he said, from that point on, I realised what they are. They really are Nazis. They may be wearing suits, they may have smart haircuts now, but underneath, the braces and the bother boots are still there, and the idealism of Hitler is still there, and that's why we call them a fascist party, and we should continue to do that. I wanted to make a couple of other points. Who votes for them? Well, the first thing to say is there's a very, very important little report here called the Democratic Audit, which I just think is an interesting thing. It says this. Our analysis, it's one of the only kind of surveys of the, of the BNP. Our analysis suggests that the BNP gains its electoral support from all three of the largest parties and not just Labour. In fact, it gains most from the Conservatives, Conservatives and least from Labour. Now, that's an interesting point to take. Likewise, if, it, if you ask the question of Conservative Party members, would you vote for the BNP in the future? 48% say yes. Only 36% of Labour members, or 36 is far too much, but 36% of Labour members say yes, and Liberal Democrats 36.9. In other words, the, the Tories are far more likely to vote for the BNP than other political 
political parties. And it seems to me that they are winning their base in areas which I think there's, there's three kind of ideas that they win their boats around. First is obvious, the, the bitterness towards uh, asylum seekers and migrants and the kind of feeling that they're taking people's jobs, housing, all this. In other words, kind of general racism in society. Secondly, the second, when they uh, surveyed these Nazis and their Nazi voters, was housing. And it's worth knowing that in Barking last year, only 12 council houses were built by Barking Council. And the third was education, national health service, and the decline in their, in their areas. And what the BNP are trying to do is they're trying to tap into that electorally, that bitterness electorally, and they're trying to tap it in it and wrap it around with patriotism, with, with the idea of being English, British, proud to be British, racism, xenophobia, hatred towards uh, Muslims, Islamophobia, and all the rest of it. And that's what the BNP are trying to do. Now, I think the first thing, and I hope we can all agree on this, is the first thing if we really want to undermine this kind of idea is I think it's quite simple. Tell Gordon Brown to stop occupying Iraq, get out of Afghanistan, because that's what's creating Islamophobia in this country, that's what's creating the racism, and if they started to do that, that might go some way in turning down tensions in this society. Secondly, build 12,000 new homes in Barking. You build 12,000 new homes in Barking next year, it takes the biggest political crisis away from the BNP and pulls the rug from underneath their feet. The last one, I think, is to tell Margaret Hodge to shut her mouth and resign. <laughs> But um, as uh, Billy has claimed in his book, The Progressive Patriot, by uh, reconciling patriotism with the radical left tradition, we can undermine the BNP. And I really want to take that argument apart with him, because it seems to me that we agree we've got to stop them. It's how we stop them. And can, rap, you know, can claiming to be patriotic radicals, does that help us in, in the case? Now, Billy's not alone. It's very fashionable right now to talk about being proud to be English. I mean, Jeremy Paxman does it. Uh, you know, Roger Scruton's wrote a book on, 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 on being English. Uh, you know, it's a kind of po popular thing. I mean, even Gordon Brown now, I mean, one of his 12 great demands was to fly the flag to show you're patriotic and, and all the rest of it. And I, I don't know if people have seen it now. There is quite a serious campaign. Paul Gordon Brown talks about, we want the flag to be like the flag in America. If you go to America, it's on every street, every national building. If you go down Whitehall right now, it's absolutely appalling. It's just British flags all over the place, just hanging down, draped over. They're trying to drape them over every single thing. They're trying to put pressure on mosques to fly the flags and all the rest of it. And really, the final straw for me came in the sun on Wednesday. That's their front page. The man, it's a disgusting front page. Fly the flag in the face of terror. That's what it says. Now, I'll tell you why I'm absolutely against the idea that somehow this is going to undermine terrorism. I mean, first of all, let me just say this. No one in their right mind supports the idea of bombing innocent people in Glasgow, in London or anything. I take that absolutely for, for, for granted. But let's be clear. This flag does not represent hope against that. In fact, I would say for the vast, for a very large part of this population, that flag and the, and the St George's flag, as it goes, represents colonialism, represents fear, represents imperialism, Ask any person from Ireland about the flag. Ask anyone from Iraq about the Union Jack. Ask anyone from Afghanistan. Ask anyone from India about the flag. That flag represents the, the, the possession of Britain over the top of their countries and represents everything that went with that persecution, oppression, violence, and, and, all, and, all, and, all, and, 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 and all the rest of it. Secondly, it gives the idea that somehow in Britain we're all together, all together fighting back. Now, I want to be really clear, you see, I don't think Gordon Brown is altogether about fighting back. In fact, I think Gordon Brown is the person responsible for these bombs going off in London, the attacks that are going on in London. And I'll tell you why I think that's the case. Because when that man attacks Iraq, when that man continues to sanction the attacks and the occupation of Afghanistan, when they continue to do that, all that does is it creates the idea that you need to fight back. These young kids think they've got to fight back somehow and they end up being tools and making themselves into bombs and, and all the rest of it. And the idea of flying the flag alongside Gordon Brown seems to me you're letting Gordon Brown off the hook. You're encouraging the idea that we've got something in common with our leaders, the same leaders that both persecute us at home and wage war abroad. And that seems to me to be going completely against what we're trying to do. Now, I want to be fair to Billy. Billy's notion of, Engli uh, 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 of Englishness differs completely radically from Brown and Paxman and the rest of it. I mean, you know, I, don't, I shouldn't have to argue this, but I'll just make it absolute, absolutely, uh, absolutely 
uh, cl uh, clear, clear by that, because Billy's idea of patriotism is not threatened by immigration. You know, he's got a proud record of fighting against racism, absolutely second to none, like I said earlier. And he has a, a, a proud record of being, proud, proud of being English and at the same time supporting working class struggles. And there's been no musician more supporting of working class struggles and everything like that. So let's, I don't want to confuse, I don't want to, to confuse this. But I want to argue, well, does it help? Does patriotism, does it help us fight against fascism? See, and the first question that makes me want to ask is, what are the values we're trying to claim from the Tories and, 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 and by being patriotic from the Tories and the BNP? What are the values that they have that we want? See, if it's the values of the Queen, is it if it's the values of subservience, then no. The answer to that is no. And I don't think Billy would support that either. But Billy would put it, I think, very much in the question of solidarity, anti-racism, multiculturalism, trade union activities. And my argument is really simple. That's got nothing to do with being English or British. It's got everything to do with solidarity, with socialism, and with the international struggle. And that's a completely separate thing. And you can be just as proud of that in France, in America, if you're working class, in Latin America, in China, in Japan. Their traditions that we share, and their international traditions of solidarity and social, they're completely opposite to the questions of patriotism and, and then the country that you, that, you come, that, you come, that, you, that you come from. You see, I want to... Um, come up for a couple of more things because uh, again Billy writes a very interesting piece in his book uh, A Progressive Patriot where he says, that, he, says that, he says the following he talks about um, let me get it um, he talks about um, the idea of uh, it talks about going to a demonstration against the BNP in a small uh, in a small 200 strong village uh, no in a village called Shaftesbury with a 200 strong anti-fascist demonstration he describes how the only opposition to that protest came from a single Nazi waving a couple of plastic English flags at the marches. He writes, What would that lonely demonstrator have done if he had seen 200 people coming towards him carrying their English flags? Would he still have been able to express his opposition by waving his own English flag? Or would, he have forced it, or would it have forced him to find another method to display his racist beliefs? A Nazi salute, perhaps. Now, you see, I don't think you can undermine the Nazis by us marching with our flags. I don't believe we can. And I'll tell you, we have a very good example of this. In, um, in Shadwell, on St. George, St George's Day, the local council calls a demonstration to celebrate St. George's Day. The last two years, the BNP have been coming along. And they've been joining the St. George's Day demonstrators with their, uh, with their flags, their Union Jacks and their St. George's flags. And now you have the situation where the BNP join that demonstration, I feel part of it, go along with everyone now. Nick Griffin's spoken at it for the last two, two years, far from undermining them. It gives them the confidence to feel that people agree more with their ideas and start to go on the street and doesn't undercut them uh, at all. But again, you see, I think what's interesting is I think Billy finds the solution in his own book. And it's a description, actually, of Billy going to the um, a and Carnival uh, you know, in Victoria Park in, was it 78? 78 anniversary next year, be Victoria Park, don't sh make sure you go along and join us, it'll be fantastic, we're going to have a Love Music Eight Racism Festival there, we're going to get all the bands back together again hopefully and uh, recreate the, the mood and get some new ones as well. Uh, this is what Billy says about arriving at Trafalgar Square, which is where the, the demonstration to Victoria Park first started. While the National Front marched beneath the ranks of Union Jacks, we gathered amid Union banners, yellow anti-Nazi League randells and pink, um, punk pink raw stars. We walked the six miles to Victoria Park in high spirits. 10,000 missiles had been handed out and we all took turns on the megaphone and led the chance of the National Front is a fascist front, smash the Nazi front. You see, that seems to me to be something completely different than carrying the flag, being patriotic. That's about us creating out of the struggle our own symbols of resistance, our own symbols against fascism, of reclaiming punks and mega boys, Teds and rockers, hippies, and whatever you want to call them, any other kind of teenage thing you can think of at that time that was kicking around. We created our own anti-racist culture. It had nothing to do with being English, but it had everything to do with saying black, white, gay, straight, women, men, together we fight back and we fight back against the Nazis. And that is, I believe, the way forward. I believe we can leave the flag behind. I believe we can put the flag behind. And I think what we have to do now is understand this, that in some ways the BNP is more difficult customer now. Because it seems to me what Nick Griffin does, he goes on to, unlike the old days. You see, when Martin Webster and Tyndall and the rest of them, they openly said they were Nazis. I remember personally being involved in the campaign on the Isle of Dogs to stop the Nazis in 92. And I remember being interviewed for BBC One TV. And I was standing there and I said, these people are Nazis. And the BBC man said, are you sure you can say that? 
and the Iron Dogs candidate, Derek Beacon, stood next to me and Ziegold. <laughs> very, very simple. <laughs> very, very simple way of deciding what political party he has. Let's be fair about it. Nick Griffin, what he's trying to do, he's trying to model his, his fascist organisations around the ideas of Le Pen, which is the ideas of electorally challenging them, not going on the streets until they're ready, but electorally challenging them in local areas, feeding on the despair, wearing the suits, denying that you're racist, but using the idea of freedom of speech to virulently attack Muslims in this country. That's the method that they're using. And therefore, we have to counter it. And I believe there's only one, two ways to, to counter that. One is the spirit of rock against racism, which love music, hate racism is now, which I believe is the idea of using culture to bring together black, white and Asian kids and say, actually, we are the majority, they are the minority. Because there's a very, very, yeah, there's a very, very important survey in there and it says this, and it's a still a fact, that the vast majority of people, 70% of the population say under no circumstances would they vote BNP or UKIP. So we are the majority and they are the minority. So, and I think we have to start to say that we have to make sure that our young kids don't get poisoned by the filth of these lies and we have to create around us a counterculture which can be used to mobilise people. That's the first thing we've got to do. Then secondly, we've got to have organisations like Unite Against Fascism, which I'm on the steering body of, which actually takes the heart of the fight all the way to the BNP, which goes locally, which takes on the BNP in the streets in terms of going around houses, winning the arguments with people, going to workplaces, schools, mosques, churches and winning a basic anti-fascist message which says... We have to stand up to these people, come out and be, and be counted. And I am proud that last year we delivered two million leaflets in Unite. Two million. And it wasn't because of all what we did in this room, it's because every mosque took the leaflet, every church took the leaflet, every, most trade unions, I think, bar none, took the leaflets and distributed them to their members. Youth clubs took it, schools took it. We've got a DVD coming out. It's going to every single school in the country taking an anti-racist message, anti message. We put like Pete Dockety on it, The View, and, and all the rest of it. And we've got to do, we've got to, we've got to do that. But I'll tell you, we've got to do something else as well which is we've got to start to also understand we have to some, sometimes confront these people nationally as well. You can't just turn around and leave it into one isolated little area. We have to say this, at some point, and Le Pen says it himself, you'll have to take the streets in order to win their, their kind of idea. And in that situation, we have to have an organisation that's also prepared to say, if they march, we fight back, just like we fought back in Lewisham, just like we fought back in Welling, just like we fought back in Cable Street. And that doesn't require cross-class alliances, what that kind of struggle re requires is the maximum unity of all working people, black, white, st black, white straight, gay, Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, Jew, everyone together. And that's our strength. Our strength is not our patriotism. Our strength is our solidarity and our ability to unite, to unite together. And the flag does not unite us. In fact, the one thing the flag does do is it ends up dividing us. And we have to reject that and find a way forward <laughs> from it. Thank Martin for, uh, for setting the tone for me. He very kindly, uh, no, seriously now, he, he kindly offered to go first because I wanted to make sure that the conversation we had wasn't the kind of conversations where I'm going around when I'm do, talking about this issue with audiences. I often pitch it in a, in a particular way and choose the, the way to go in. And I felt strongly that if Martin spoke first, he would, he would be able to focus me and he would give me the sort of parameter so we could have the sort of debate uh, that, that you want. And I want to thank Martin for going first and allowing me to do that. I really appreciate that. Of course, as Martin, Martin's subtext, I think, was that, that there, are me, there are many things that we, we agree on. And I think in, in, in trying to, to pitch this idea of progressive patriotism to you, I think I'll, I'll, I will begin by saying that patriotism, like Marxism, has many shades. And you know that from your experience within this room. To the outsider, Marxism is one particular thing. It's, it's Stalinism. It's uh, uh, totalitarianism. It has no light and dark. And I would argue that you are seeing patriotism in the same way. You are seeing the excesses that were done in the name of the British Empire. You are seeing the awful things that were done uh, in, in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, exploitation under the guise of imperialism. You're seeing the racism that goes on beneath the Union Jacks of the, the British National Party in, in, in our day when we first began fighting the National Front. You're seeing that, but you're seeing that alone. There's other aspects of, of 
of loving your country and loving your people that go much, much deeper than mere symbols and iconography, the sort of thing that Gordon Brown wants to promote, where we're talking about the Britain that I love is a society. It's not a state. It's not an army. It's not a monarchy. It's a society, a society with many people coming together who time and time again have stood up for the idea of I know this is not the language you use, but the idea of fairness. Strangely enough, when people are asked about what it means to be British, because there is no definition, by the way, you know, these ideas, people throw these ideas, Englishness, Britishness, these are words that actually mean different things to different people. <coughs> Identity, I believe, ultimately is personal. You are what you think you are. And it only becomes an issue when someone gets in your face and tries to tell you what you are in terms of your religion or your accent or your colour or your gender or your sexuality. Identity ultimately um, is personal. So trying for my definition of what Britishness is, we may disagree. But I would like to think that in this audience my definition of Britishness would resonate. Because as I say, it, it's based on ideas and moments where the British people manifested a sense of fairness that changed our history. The first example of that would be Magna Carta in, in 1215. Now, I know the barons are not fine exemplars of, work, of the working class tradition. They're big, fat bastards on horses. However, <laughs> the issue of holding authority to account is rooted in our tradition in this country. The idea that, that, that we should have rule by consent Maybe not in terms of democracy back in 1215, but the idea that, that the person or persons in charge should be held to account. The Magna Carta was the first document of its kind in Europe. And it continued to inspire people uh, all the way up to the, to the, the revolutions of the 16, uh, 1600s. The Civil War, the English Civil War, was fought on the issue of rule by consent. It wasn't fair that the king could raise an army, could declare war, could raise taxes without calling Parliament, without Parliament's consent. In fact, they took their sense of fairness to, so far that they, they chopped his head off in the name of fairness. You know, they, they, when they captured Charles I, when they captured Charles I, they could have dealt with him in the traditional way, killed on the battlefield or round the back of the throne, dagger between the shoulder blades, all over. But because the Parliament believed in ideas of fairness. They did something that had never, ever been done before. They put a king on trial for treason. Before the trial of Charles I in 1649, treason was something you did against the monarch. After that, treason was something you did against the people. And we, the British people, we founded that idea. We came up with that idea. That's our tradition. And this tradition of rule by consent, all right, it didn't work out. What happened was they brought the monarchy back. But they brought the monarchy back on the terms that Charles I had refused. And even when that didn't work out, they, they changed again and, and had to bring in a, a king from across the water uh, in, the, in the form of William of Orange. But all this was done in order to encourage the idea of rule by consent, holding the executive to account, a sense of fairness. Now, this long struggle for fairness carried on throughout the 18th century, through the 19th century, with the Chartists, the first working class movement in world history. The Chartists there for the right to vote because it simply wasn't fair that you had to own a large house in order to vote. The suffragettes, it simply wasn't fair that, you know, that voting was based on gender. This, this, is a, this is the tradition I'm talking about that I feel patriotic about. And for those people who are, you know, we all know in this room, in fact everybody in this country knows, that the idea that the the British people are a fair and tolerant people is an aspiration rather than a reality. We all know that. But just because it's an aspiration rather than a reality, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be out there encouraging people to come uh, and live up to those aspirations because we all of us benefit uh, under, um, as a result of the, the one thing that proves that the British people, when pressed, believe in fairness, and that is the example of the foundation of the welfare state in 1948. There is our historical proof that we are a people who believe in fairness. And as I say, that idea travels all the way back to 1215, but it also moves forward as well. 
And it's a, it's a story along that historical narrative. And the thing that, that the, the Muslim population, British Muslims, have in common now with the barons in 1215 is that they were people who currently are excluded. They are excluded by their religion and by their ethnicity. They are people who are excluded from participating fully in society, just as the barons were excluded. And so our history, our tradition, is a tradition of people being excluded, coming in to, to join society and be part of society on their terms. Those are the great struggles that went on in the 1880s. In the, in the book, I write at great length about my great Great -grand my great-grandfather who worked in Beckton Gasworks during the New Union period, of my other great-grandfather who was sacked during the 1912 dock strike for literally for going on strike. He was a permanent labourer, and the permanent labourers were helping to keep the docks open. Eventually they struck as well, and when all the rest of the casual labourers were allowed back to work, the permanent labourers were excluded, and they had to go back on strike again to get the permanent men back in. But that class solidarity uh, was what led ultimately to the Labour victory in 45 and the foundation of the welfare state from which all of us still, still benefit and which most of us feel strongly will stand there and, and defend. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a progressive patriotism, of reminding people that that's who we are. And no, in no, very few places in, in Britain could that idea be more firmly rooted than embarking. Barking has been Labour since it was carved out of Essex in 1931. Huge majorities. It's more, you know, Barking doesn't really belong in the South East. It's an industrial, an industrial area. It's a huge car factory at Dagenham. When I left school, there were 30,000 people working here. When I said I didn't want to work at Ford's, when I went to see my career officer, he said, we've well, got three choices, son, the Army, the Navy or the Air Force. That's, that's what we were being trained. And it was good work. It was good work. And when I was a kid... Our street in Barking, where my mother still lives, was full of people from Ireland, straight from Ireland. Their, their uh, fathers had such strong accents, I often could, had to look at my friends when they spoke for them to translate to me. They went and worked at the car factory, most of them on the line. They worked hard, they earned a lot of money in those days, and they moved off to somewhere leafy beginning with Chur, like Chigwell or Chingford or those kind of people. And, and so they were followed by people from the Alpha Caribbean, they did exactly the same thing, people from, uh, from India, from Bangladesh. But now that's finished. That's over. The car factory is barely there now. The A13 runs right through the middle of where the main body plant used to be. They're employing a tenth of the people that they were when I was at school. And they're not even making cars anymore. That whole skilled workforce and the infrastructure around it has gone. The reason the British National Party are embarking is because Barking has the lowest house price in the whole of London. The British National Party, they're not the stupid skinheads that we fought back in the 70s. They read the same sort of reports that Martin was showing there that you and I read. That's why they came and realised that Barking was somewhere where they could, they could get into people's faces and exploit their fears. One town, the IPP are found in, uh, in after the 2000 and and one census. The town in Britain which had the largest influx of people, residents, born outside the United Kingdom, Barking. These guys have been doing their homework. That's why they're there. That's why they know why it's fertile ground. And who have New Labour sent us to represent the people of Barking? You have to remember before we had an MP called Joe Richardson, who some of you might remember, who was a great MP. She was a truly great member of Parliament. And then they send us Margaret Hodge. Uh, you know, new, people see her on the doorstep and she's New Labour exemplified. That's why <laughs> 8 out of 10 of them told her that they were going to vote for the BNP even though those numbers didn't vote for the BNP. But let me tell you this, they got 12 councillors uh, on Barkin and Dagenham uh, Council. Um, they stood 13. And friends, there may be some here tonight who are at the count, will tell you that there were hundreds of spoiled ballot papers from other wards saying, where is our BNP candidate? If they'd have stood a full slate, they would have won Barkin and Dagenham Council. And they may even, they may even win uh, the, the general election. They'll make a very strong showing there. And what the problem is, the problem that we have to face, is these are white working class people who have voted, always voted Labour, always voted traditional Labour, going directly to the British National Party. In the Goresbrook ward, where they had their first member elected, 52% of people in that ward voted for the fascist, racist 
British National Party. Now, we can stand here and, and, and dismiss the, what they're doing there, the people of Barking and Dagenham, but I think we would be wrong to do that. Ultimately, the BNP, as Martin has already said, are a racist, fascist party. The people who are voting them for them are not necessarily themselves fascists. They are very, very angry people who are lashing out, and they're looking for the most blunt object with which to attack the Labour Party. And at the moment, in Barking and Dagenham, that happens to be the British National Party. But the point is, if we ignore those people, if we reject those people and what they're talking about, then I think we will, we will be deeper, deeper and deeper in, in, in trouble because the, the concerns of the people of Barking and Dagenham, and those concerns can be summed up really uh, in, in the issue of too many people chasing too few resources. That's what's happening out there in terms of housing, schools, doctors. If we, you know, we can't dismiss those concerns. Those, those concerns must be addressed, not by racism and by fascism, but in the way that they've always been addressed before, by democratic socialism. That's always paid off for the people of Barking and Dagenham in terms of housing and building hospitals, in terms of resources. The, the left have always delivered from. In fact, it's a scary thing if you, you know, they've been going knocking on doors saying to people in Barking and Dagenham, we are the Labour Party your parents voted for. Because if you do take away the racist, fascist immigration policies, their, their house building program and other issues are hugely protectionist. But, but the sort of thing that the Labour Party did run in back in the day. So what I'm saying is that by, and, I, and I'm appalled by that front page of the Sun, I might add my, and you know, that puts me off as well to see it being used by that. But if we constantly refuse to deal with the idea of national identity, not nationalism, but national identity, and, and you know, maybe we can talk about this afterwards, I would argue that national identity for the majority of people in this country is a much more stronger notion than class identity. You know, it's, it's, that's a reality we have to deal with, I'm afraid. In some ways, as we've had the decline of um, the, uh, uh, the, the Cold War uh, and the, the great ideological discourses of the, of the, of the 80s, the vacuum has been formed and unfortunately nationalism has filled that vacuum. And, and we, Traditionally, as we always have, because we believe in, in internationalism, we have shied away from dealing with ideas of national identity. I'm saying we need to grasp this nettle. We need to find a new language where which we bring the same ideals, the same uh, arguments, but couch them in terms of helping those people who are predominantly white working class with their culture. Let me just briefly read out the sort of thing I'm talking about. I literally got this letter yesterday in the mail. Dear Bill, I write to you and you may be interested in regarding the Pesky Brothers in Ripple Road, Barking, the fish and chip show. I don't know if you've been around that way recently, but this fantastic little shop is now shut and has been for a while now. Apparently, it's shut down due to the guy who ran it retiring. I don't know if you can recall, recall it, but it's a real gem. Acid etched glass windows with elaborate fish designs the main shop sign is great, real 1950s masterpiece, and the interior is like something out one of those black and white beat films from the 1960s. Orange and white formica, wooden chairs, etc., plus an old cash till. I saw it yesterday, and I'm really concerned that it will be ripped apart and turned into another KFC. Now, what we're seeing here is really what is at the heart of the problem out of Embarking and Dagenham. A people with a proud culture, a local culture, their own culture, being torn apart by change which is forced on them by globalisation. Their fight is our fight. And we have to talk to them in terms of saving their local ship, chip shop, as well as helping them to deliver socialism as well. Because it's the cultural aspects of what they lose, the change around them, that feeling that they are completely uh, uh, disempowered in the face of globalisation that makes it possible for us to go in there and talk to them. But we do need to talk to them in terms of rather than what is happening in Palestine and Iraq, important though those things are, we need also to be able to talk to them in terms of what is happening to their local old chip shop. And I just want to finish off by saying two very, very brief things. I'm opposed to any sort of idea of forcing people to fly the Union Jack or to celebrate St George's Day. That's not what I'm interested in. I think we all have to make our own accommodation. That's why the book is really about belonging rather than patriotism. But I will say this, 
St. George, you know, was born in Lebanon. You know, he came over here looking for work as a saint, as a, as a patron saint. <laughs> Uh, you know, he managed to do it cheaper than St. Edmund and uh, St. Edward the Confessor. And he's also working two jobs because he's a patron saint of Barcelona as well. So there's a, there's a message for us in there. And one final thing, just as in my book, the answer to my question was there. I think Martin, Martin's uh, uh, opening comment has also given me, uh, uh, he's, he's given me the answer as well. The reason why we need to take the flag away from the British National Party is because it fucking annoys them. That's why. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to just uh, briefly respond to some of the questions. The first one from, uh, from uh, Bashoat, uh, asking uh, in the climate of created by terrorism um, would lead to similar situations in the 1930s in Germany. How, how did the BNP uh, make capital out of things? Within uh, a day or so of the 77 bombings, the BNP got a leaflet out of Barking saying, we told you so. They thrive, they thrive on the rhetoric of the war on terror. And I do feel strongly, it had July 7th not happened, the BNP wouldn't have won a dozen councils. There was that kind of reaction there. Um, to, to, the speaker who quoted Lenin, I would, I would like to respond by a quote from Robbie the Pitt, not quite the same moment. Um, <laughs> More hair than wearing a um, But he once explained to me, he's a, he's a Scots nationalist, very, very strong, progressive Scots nationalist, and he's absolutely clear on that. With Lenin, actually, he said, you can't be a nationalist in your own country. He said, we don't, this is before the, the Scottish Assembly was formed, he said, we don't run our country, our country is run from another country. But once we do run our own country, then I'll no longer be a nationalist, so I have to do something else. You can't be a nationalist in your own country. And I agree with that. I thoroughly agree with that. Um, well, you know, we're talking about the flag and, and Mark Roman there standing up for, for English football. There are very few opportunities for the white working class to express their national identity. Football is the largest one of them. And what do they do when they go there? What does that flag stand for, that flag St. George? When you look at the team, it's a multicultural team. It reflects our society. These are a bunch of working class lads, most of them in school when they were 16. And there they are standing together, representing us around the world. Uh, they are a genuine representation of our society, the way it is, not the way the Daily Mail wants our society to look. They are the reality of England in the 21st century, and I think that helps to undermine the fascists. The influx of foreigners into British football has clearly undermined the fascists, particularly places like West Ham, where, where for my sins, I support which has one of the worst reputations of fascism of football. Um, with regard to the flag, I think we've got a bit high bound with the flag here. It's probably my fault, for which I apologise. One of the interesting things, though, about being British is that all of us have two flags. We have the flag of the state to which we belong, which our passports come from, which is the Union Jack, and then we have the flag of the nation that we think of as home. In my case, that's England. My other flag is the flag of St George. In my wife's case, she was born in Trinidad. Her flag is the flag of Trinidad and Tobago. And during the World Cup, when we next door put up the flag of St George and the other, the other people on the other side fly the Union Jack all the time just to annoy me, uh, I said to my, my missus, wouldn't it be great because Trinidad and Tobago were playing England in the World Cup, we're in the same group. I said to, to my missus, wouldn't it be great if we had the flag of Trinidad and Tobago? And so, you know, you can do the internet. I sent away within 48 hours, the flag had come back. I said, ta da! She said, what's that? <laughs> I'm glad we turned it out to Vega and she said, Brilliant, stick it up on the balcony. So I've got a broom pole, tied it to the balcony, everyone could see it all around the village where we lived, and uh, they just assumed that we were Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wonder of flags. Um, fairness and, 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 and rights, fundamental rights. The subject that a lot of Browns talk about British at the moment is the idea of having a British Bill of Rights. Forget a British bit. Just concentrate on the idea of rights, the fundamental bill of rights that apply to everybody in this country, whether they're a citizen or not. The fu basic fundamentals of, of the European Convention plus jury trial that we have as fundamental rights. We need these rights. Our liberties are being eroded by the so-called war, war on terror. We can't do a great deal about that because in our country, unlike in other countries where the Constitution controls the government, our government controls the Constitution. If this were to change and we were to have a set of, of principles and rights based on fairness and equality, 
Not only would that give people who are coming to our country something to, to work to, but it would also empower them to challenge us to be fair and the tolerant people that we claim to be. So the argument about rights, fundamental rights, we're talking civil rights here, can only lead to the arguments of, of economic rights and put those rights on the agenda. This, this idea of grounds to bring in, to repatriate the European Convention is something that has a great deal for us in that, in getting across fundamental international rights right across the European Union. I think it's a very, very important agenda. I also agree greatly with the comrade who spoke about collective action. That's what happened. That's how the Chartists came together with the suffragettes. And, and, and yes, we do, of course, we relate to, to those other revolutions around the world. You know, Thomas Paine was from, was from, uh, from Bedford. You know, so, that, you know, we are all of us linked internationally. And I, I don't surrender my internationalism to anyone. Uh, but, but it's also part of my identity. Another comrade there explained, you know, being uh, born in Africa, Asian background, you know, it's personal. I'm not asking you for all to go outside and, and wave the Union Jack and feel comfortable with that. But I am asking you to look at ways, many ways, that we can undermine the British National Party and what they're trying to do in the name of patriotism. As a comrade has on his t-shirt over there, by any means necessary. And progressive patriotism, comrades, is one, just one, but one of those means. The first thing I have to say, right, is I think many people do find it uncomfortable when people wear the Union Jack and wear their, their T-shirts. That's a fact. That's an absolute fact. That's an absolute fact. Why? Because I think someone said it very early on, and it's worth us restating that British nationalism, British is linked with the oppression of one third of the world, and it's hated throughout the world, and it makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable, including many white English people, so-called white English people, don't find that very happy at all. The second thing is about patriotism. It seems to me it's a double-edged to patriotism because I think people want to have it both ways. You see, when you talk to Gordon Brown about what kind of patriotism he wants, he wants nationhood, partnership. These are masks to the real divisions in society. We don't live in a partnership. At all. It's not a partnership between Crozier and the post workers. There's a class conflict between the post workers and the head of it. There's a class conflict between Gordon Brown and the rest of us. And I think it's very important we see that. And secondly, I don't think we should have any illusions in the Constitution. That America, as a Constitution, as a Bill of Rights, tell that to the people in Guantanamo Bay. Where's their rights? They haven't got any. It's not about the concept, it's about the relations in society, about what the government thinks they can and they can't get away with. And our job is no, to resist. Why are they in Cuba and not in Alabama? It's simply because well. it's not allowed. That's not allowed in the United States of America. It does work. That's an example of that. Well. I don't, I don't believe this is in Cuba it's any better. It's like rendition, flight renditions. It doesn't make it any better. And we shouldn't have any, any illusions in that. And I don't think we should accept it because America can put it somewhere else. Don't make it any, any better at all. They could get away with internment in Ireland. It didn't make it right in Britain. So we should make sure we don't have anything to do with that. And I think the problem is our side, the people who say want progressive papers, and what's it come down to? If you read Billy's book and you listen to Mark, it seems to me to come down to wanting to go to football, liking jelly deals, liking all kinds of, you know, all those kind of things, a bit of Iron Age for ill thought here, a bit of Beckton Gus Rose here, a bit of solidarity here. It's just a mishmash. I tell you, I just read this book. It's a very good book. It's a very good book. But I'll tell you why it's a very good book. Because it's all about inventing patriotism, all about inventing nationalism. This is what they try to do in Scotland and Wales. You found out they, found, they painted the daffodil the wrong colour, but they decided to keep it a yellow daffodil in the end because, by the way, because someone made a mistake. I don't believe this is any way, 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 way forward for, for, for us. I think what we're doing right now is we're looking for a shortcut. We're looking... I've got to get another book now. <laughs> We're looking, we're looking for uh, shortcuts. And I'll tell you why we're looking for shortcuts, because this is what... It's your book. Definitely your book. <laughs> Which is Britishness versus multiculturalism. This is what Billy says. It is broadly accepted fact that over the last 50 years, Britain has become a classless society. I know. It's heresy. That's how I heresy. It is heresy, though, Billy. Honestly, it really is her heresy, because... We live in a society where the rich and the poor, the gap between them is growing. We live in a society where workers are exploited by this government. That is how we're for. I'm sorry. It's not where we start. We don't live in a classless society. I am not the same as the bloody Queen and never have been. I've got nothing in common with the Queen. I've got nothing in common with Gordon Brown. I have more in common with my Turkish neighbour, my Chinese neighbour, where I live in Acne. That's the truth of it. I have nothing in common with these people. 
And you don't need to look for a home with a flag. You look for a home with your people. It's called class. Our people is our class. Working people against the bosses. And once we blur that distinction, then we play into their hands, which they believe is their most powerful tool, which is nationalism. I'm sorry. They believe that using nationalism undermines us and undermines the struggle. You see, when you say, I love my country, I love my people, what people? We're not, but Britain is not one lot of people. There is not one. When you had the NHS, which you said was a fantastic thing, which is one of the great things the Labour government in 1945 51 ever achieved, it was opposed. It was opposed by the Tories. We're not one people all loving the NHS. There are those that want the NHS because it helps the poor in this country, and there's those against it. I remember my nan, just before she died, she told me that when she voted like Labour in 1945, she went and got a, two pairs of false teeth. And she got two pairs of false teeth because she thought one was what she needed, and the second lot were in case the Tories got back in and got away with it. <laughs> And so we didn't, it wasn't just, it's, it's, these are things that are under attack and you have to have a class, a class thing. Same thing with the firefighters. I think Wayman's point about the firefighters has to be reasserted. The firefighters, of course, you don't denounce any firefighter who wants to carry the flag or wants to wear an England badge. Of course you don't do that. You don't call them the enemy. Never have done, never will do. But I do say this. It did not help their struggle. It's not about what you individually do. It's about does carrying the flag, does the idea of being patriotic help you or not in those kind of struggles? And when they sold the firefighters dispute on the basis of not upsetting the British troops in Iraq, then it was an aid. It was not an aid to go forward. It actually ended up pushing us backwards and back the wrong way. And I think that's used time and time again. You see, and if we get down to fish and chip shops, really, we're not going to get to save our fish and chip shop by saying we're all British or all English or anything to do with it. We're going to do it by ordinary people petitioning, ordinary people campaigning against the council, ordinary people campaigning against multinationals, whether it's Kentucky Fried Chicken or McDonald's. We're not going to do it through bloody going around saying what it's about being English, we've got to serve English identity. Rubbish. Nothing to do with it at all and never, and never will be. Last couple two more final points. Mark Perryman says, uh, come along to an England football match. Well, I've been to England football matches and... Never liked, much liked him, not, uh, not, not bothered about it. So I don't have a problem with that, you see. But what I do think is that the problem with what you're arguing, Mark, is a couple of points, really. One is that the idea of using nationalism, progressive nationalism or progressive patriotism, whatever term you want to, to use, is a shortcut. And you're not, you would not be the first or the last person to try this out. I mean, the truth of it is, one of my great heroes, Woody Guthrie, made exactly that kind of make that attempt through the Communist Party in America in the, 19, in the late 30s and early 40s. And where did it get them? It ended up with McCarthyism. You start saying, we have no classes, we're all one nation against fascism. Where did it lead? 1946 to the big question, are you now or have you ever been a member of the, the Communist Party? Again, George Orwell. Yes, Orwell, the lion and the unicorn, tried to use a kind of revolutionary nationalism in order to kind of propel uh, class forward. Did it help? No, it didn't. It wasn't the, 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 key, the, the key fact. And I think we can't learn that mistake. And I learned it very, very quickly, you see. Many years ago, probably 1983, 1984, I was uh, living in Bethnal Green at the time, and there was a band, uh, SWP band, called the Redskins. And we had a, a great band, absolute great band, and they had an argument about reclaiming skinhead culture from the far right. Now, I'm not against people doing it. I did it myself, so, you know, if we're going to attack people, let's attack me for doing it. I remember shaving my head off, a skinhead haircut, I had bleached jeans on and DMs. And I remember walking down Bethnal Green High Road, and I remember seeing a Bengali family walking towards me, and I saw them stop, and they crossed the road. They crossed the road. Why? They didn't know, because they thought skinheads, fascist. Actually, they don't wait to find out if you're a red skin or a, or a Nazi skinhead. They crossed the road, and I vowed from that day on, I weren't going to carry things that, that, that would make people feel you. And what's that, what is there to reclaim? What was there to reclaim out of skinhead culture? In fact, it's a quite reactionary. And in some sense, of course, there's positive elements. We can all talk about the great positive elements of it, taking up black scar music and all the rest of it. But come on, when you glorify violence, when it's associated with it, what is there to reclaim? What is there possibly worth getting out, getting out, getting out from that? And I say the same thing about it. You said the same thing in your book. When you were driving along towards that demo and you saw people who were going to football matches with their flag and you were worried... You were right because you thought, oh, are they BNP members? Why do we want to reclaim something that puts fear into a whole section of society? Why do we, what's that to reclaim about that? Why should we want to reclaim that in, 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 in any way? And I'll tell you why it's also a, a, a shortcut, because there can't be a way around it. We have to take the hard arguments on, which means both understanding that and then and going with it. You see, embarking, 
You see, it seems to me two, two things. The reason the BNP are gaining in Barking is Labour have deserted the people of Barking. They have stabbed in the back of the heart the people of Barking. We agree. We agree on that. But there's nothing different about the people of Barking than the people of Tower Hamlets. But there's one difference. In Tower Hamlets, the people of Tower Hamlets voted respect. Because, and in Barking, they voted BNP. Why? Because I believe, unlike Una King, who's represented absolutely nothing, warmonger and all the rest of it, right, I believe that in respect, what respect did is it took on the question of housing, took on the question of racism, took on the question of poverty, took on the question of war, and turned it to the left to a progressive forward. The problem in Barking is the BNP are trying to fill that vacuum. And I'm sadly, I don't believe you can just have a situation where you can rely on Labour to fill it again, because I actually believe that the Labour Party are actually attacking all the people. They're going to increase that business. They're going to continue the war in Iraq. Gordon Brown's going to attack workers' wages and attack the post workers. That's going to create even more business. In that situation, just saying don't vote Nazi is not enough. Just saying to keep them out, because I'll tell you what, I've been saying it in East London now for 15, 20 years. I've been going around with the same lit, don't vote Nazi, keep the Nazis out, organise, we push them back. Sometimes they come forward. Other times, there has to be a political solution to this question as well as just campaigning against them. That's to be a positive message because the question is when you say don't vote Nazi, the question then is who do you vote for? And actually, just saying vote Labour again seems to me you're going back in a vicious circle. We have to break out for that and have, have, an, and have an alternative to that as well. I want to make two final points. Which is this. I don't know if you've seen the film, Billy, but you should see a film called This Is England. Is that the title? Of... You should see it. It's a brilliant film. And it ends. I'm going to spoil the ending for people, but I think you have to spoil the ending sometimes. <laughs> he dies. He doesn't. He doesn't die. It ends with this. The young little skinhead kid, kid has his flag. And he goes, all these horrific things. You'll see it yourself. And he, yeah, I'm going to finish now. And he goes to the seaside after he's been betrayed by his friends. And he takes his flag and he throws it in the sea. Because it offered no way out of poverty for that kid, no way out of bullying, no way out of the cycle of unemployment and, and oppression that working class people felt. It was no way forward. And I don't believe it's a way forward for you. And I have to say this, I think we get on a slippery slope when we start trying to reclaim flags, talk about patriotism. It goes against the grain of our whole tradition. Our whole tradition has not been one of patriotism. Our whole tradition is one of internationalism, of solidarity, and of working class people, whatever their skin, standing together. And once you try and blur those distinctions, you make it easier for the bosses to take us on. You make it easier for the racists to exploit it. And I'll just end on this. Nick Griffin at last year's Red, White and Blue Festival said he welcomed people, more people carrying the flag. He welcomed more people carrying, wearing England shirts. He said, why? Because it means our ideas become fashionable. And he ended with this. Because what we have to do, then and then people say, don't worry about the, the falsehood. We're the real McCoy. We're the real patriots come to us, and this is what Le Pen does. Our job is to create a new culture that takes them on both politically and in the struggles and fights them because that is the key task. You see, it's what inspired Billy. Come back to your roots, Billy, because we need that inspiration again because that's how we're going to beat the BNP. <laughs>